first of all, Web3 is something which I don't think I'm even going to touch because it's a horribly controversial sub subject. What is Web3? Are we still in a Web2 world? Are we moving to Web2, Web3? So I'm going to touch on it a bit, but it's with our geographic viewpoint. Um, just talking about how you can put your work online. Everything's via Twitter. All of our work is on YouTube. We mass outreach. Uh, we do fly-throughs using software that you can play about with on the iPad as a game. And we just try to, we, we try to use the web from a research point of view as much as we possibly can. Hey, Andy. So just put a couple of slides in just to set where, where we are. Web, web one was just where we used to read a web page. You just five or eight years a year ago, you just read a web page and that's all you, that's all you could do. We're in the web two world now where you can read write. So you can read web pages, you can log into social networks and you can type in your own views. This is a read write world. Okay. And that's, to be honest, that's changed our research lab an awful lot because most of our software toolkits, which we're making now, and most of our academic research is Web2 based. So we're social outreaching, re we're using Twitter, we're using Facebook, but we're not just using it from a communication point of view, view we're mining it too. So we grab the things that you tweet the things that you say, and we geographically locate them. But we're interested in moving towards Web3 because you can read, write, execute, which means you can run your own stuff. So rather than just have a so social network, you can run your own software. You can put research toolkits online, which are easy to use. One of the things we found in our world is that there's a lot of portals out there. There's a lot of toolkits. And they're all, I know, they're all quite difficult to use. They're aimed at the academic sector. And we don't do that, actually. We've aimed all of our work, which I think you'll see halfway through, at more of a mass market sector. Because if you're going to get your work used, I believe it shouldn't have such an academic vibe linked to it. And that brings up new research viewpoints, a new techniques we can use. So throwing away about 2,000 years worth of research, Geography 2 and 3, just to link in with the web themes. Geography 2, I'd argue, I don't know, happened five years ago, and it annoyed so many people. Just people from an academic point of view got really, really upset that we were allowing the public to make maps. No, no, you can't allow the public to do stuff because that's what we're trained in. This is what professionals do. We're academics. We, this is what we do. No, 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 you don't let the public do what we do. It upset quite, quite, quite a lot of people. Geography 3, I'd say, is moving into the real-time geography. So towards the end of the talk, I think we've got something in place which allows us to do the geography of everything now the chairs that you sat in, the lamps, the clock on the wall, geographically locating everything in the entire world. And that means we can run things behind the scenes. We can try and see how the world works. I think that will be geography 3.0, but it's a horribly controversial to to topic. And this is just my own personal view. The Gartner hype cycle. Every talk should have a Gartner hype cycle in because most of the research I've done is in the trough. So we look at the left-hand side, and we aim to do research on the, the left, tech which is rising up the hype cycle. You get the research done, you get the papers out, and it goes down to a trough where no one uses it. We did a lot of virtual world work. Second Life, it was a wave of hype, it was the front page of, front page of, um, a global magazine and their marketing department was amazing and we did various research output but then it completely dropped off the edge of a cliff it just went so this is where virtual worlds are but we're beginning to see that the research that we do does come in 
to the real world. So I think there's about a two year sighing cycle here. So we're looking at the left hand side to try and see what is coming next. And it's arguably about collecting and sensing at this current time, moving towards Web 2, Web 3. And then we're looking in the next year, 18 months, to try and predict the short-term future. Modelling has always been in you know, a five, ten years' time, future of housing, future of crime, future of transport. We're interested in like the next 30 minutes, which turns out is quite hard. But that is what research is here for. So to state an, a basic fact, everything has a location, but we don't use it. We don't use the location of things at, at this point. But we can locate, map, and basically visualise everything nowadays, and increasingly in real time. So I'm going to do a bit of show and tell, because these things don't always work. Augmented reality. I wrote a paper on this five years ago, saying it was the next big thing. I thought I was wrong. You know, there are times when you put down, you think, oh, predicting the future up to 2015. No, it could be flying cars, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd got it wrong. But we might be coming back. So I'm intrigued by these markers, low-cost tagging. This is more of an urban planning architecture type stuff, planning for real, where people normally use sort of people, things made of wood and cardboard but now you can use tagging. So you can get a 3D CAD output, you can use multiple tags, and you can slide things in and out. And the interesting thing is here, is that you're putting it in people's hands. So we're almost trying to move away from the web and put geography into people's hands using low-cost software, open source software, and low-cost technology. So, this is always very unwise, but I'm going to show you the future, possibly, using a ruler <coughs> and a piece of paper. <laughs> which may or may not work. So I've got an app on my iPhone, which has a 3D Twitter map, which I will show you later. Point the marker at the wall, uh, left-handed, and the phone recognises the marker. And if you move the marker up, your 3D Twitter map appears. So that means that you can put all sorts of geographic information onto markers. Now, these aren't very nice markers. They don't look nice. So we're moving on to poster-type work. So there's always at research events, there's PhD posters up. I, I have the attention span of a goldfish nowadays. I just, I, I find it hard to to concentrate on things. But if there was a poster I could point my iPad at, I'm going to ask Stephen or Richard, could you hold this at an angle? Then there's apps you can put on your phone that you just load up, and it should recognize the marker, and a 3D view appears. Then once it's grabbed it, you can actually zoom in. So you don't have to have the poster in view the whole time once it gets to the viewpoint. So just really easy and actually quite low-cost ways, thanks, Stephen, to put geographic in information online and to share it, but in ways that you wouldn't normally see. Now, unfortunately, since I was about to do this talk, this has just reached mass market. There's the card company called moonpig.com. They've just launched it. So you point your phone with the Moonpig app at, at your Moonpig card, and it plays a movie clip of what you've recorded saying ha happy birthday and that sort of stuff. So interested towards moving towards a live atlas here, because again, attention spans are getting shorter. But if I can get a book that I can open in a Harry Potter type way, perhaps, where you point your iPhone or your Android or your whatever webcam you've got, you point it at it, and it just sort of makes it live. But the non-marker augmented reality is the one that's got the most hype. Um, 
There's a company called Layer out there which currently leads this world, and this is completely geographic based. And this is how they think the future of the future of uh, non-marker based augmented reality is. Layer is a platform where everybody can create their own fantastic augmented reality experiences. Augmented reality is a new mass media. It's where the real world is combined with digital information. We're going to bring these digital experiences into reality. And you're going to engage into reality with this new medium. Today with Layer you can experience history, art, ATM finder, real estate for sale, how things looked uh, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, Foursquare, Twitter, tourism, sports, commerce, gaming, social. Gaming in augmented reality is a completely new genre. Interacting with objects right in front of you. You know, we got crazy shit on there. <laughs> so I'm going to fade the sound down there. So yeah, we've, there's, I don't know, there's some crazy shit out, out there from a layer point of view. But I don't think that's how the world works. So I've done this with a friend. And you've got your phone out and you're pointing it. And unfortunately, well, my life is not like that. Uh, she wasn't with her arm around my shoulder, you know, loving <laughs> the whole augmented reality. In fact, she looked at me and called me a sad little man. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as much as I love tech, I don't think this is where geographic future currently is yet. But <laughs> it's all about sensing too. So my phone, it can sense it. It can sense noise, colour, light, temperature, perhaps a few of the an Android phones, but pitch, pitch, direction, speed. And it's one of the most powerful com computers we have now, but everyone has them, or at least a lot of our core market has them. So we're interested in sensing the crowd and pushing information to the phone. So not just grabbing information, but pushing. Because if you get something on the Apple front page, you've got millions of users that you can stream things from, you can grab research data <coughs> from. One of the people in our lab made mappiness.org.uk. And it asks you five times a day how happy you are. It gives you a little push notification and it reached the Apple front page, so it's got millions of users. And it allows you to take a photograph, take a sample of the noise, and it looks at where you are. So it samples colour. Turns out we are happier with things which are surrounded by green trees. And we're also happier at weekends and we're happier by the sea. Now, you could say, well, yeah, you'll know this. But it's grabbing geographic location at every point. So it's mapping where people are happier there and then. Uh, there's a researcher I know who won't be named, but his wife didn't like it much because she looked at his maps and his little graphs, and he was happier with his secretary at work <laughs> than he was at home. So users come, users go. But it's graphing things. It's putting gauges online. It's putting a feedback loop in place. So people will send you information, and you send them information back. And there's something in this. And unfortunately, it was made by a guy called George, and he leaves next month. He's, it's, 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 it's one of those things as a research lab, you get really good people in and then they want a lecturing post and you lose them. But it's things like this. This came out of his just normal research PhD work. And if you can get PhDs and you get onto the Apple front page, you know, it's really changing the research world. And Twitter, who here tweets? Are you tweeting now? One. Two, three. Yeah, not, not, not bad. Twitter is either heavily frowned upon from an academic point of view or an amazing toolkit. Uh, I tweet. Uh, 3,800 people read my tweets every time I send a tweet. I only tweet about work, 
So don't tweet that I'm, I'm at lunch and that sort of stuff. It's only research. But it's a mass way to get the research out there and to get it used. And we made the, the um, tweeter me meter, which begins to mine things. So we're grabbing the number of tweets around the world. And we can grab hash hashtags too. And the interesting thing from, from a Twitter point of view is that you've clicked yes to the terms. This is the London over the weekend and its Twitter network. And we're grabbing this, so we're mining these tweets. And we grab not only the location, but what you say too. Which is great from a research point of view, because we can use it to try and work out where people are and what they say. So trying to move towards a real-time census in the next three or four years. So more and more tracking-based work. Um, one of the interesting things, and I will move this movie on for the sake of time, is that this is Heathrow Runway 1. I, I believe you're meant to have your phone turned off. And all these tweets pop up. But this flies out now, and it flies into someone's house. And he sends a tweet, which is probably too dark to see, that says, happy birthday, kiss, kiss, kiss. And you're okay, well, who's, who's he sending this tweet to? Does this person know that we can zoom into your house and know what you said? And it, it begins to get ethical quest questions come up. But we are moving to a more and more trackable world. You know, the iPhone, the latest iOS 6 software, has traffic mapping. So when it senses that I'm in a car, because my movement's quick, it will track where I am, and it sends it live updates, and you can't turn it off. You just can't turn it off. It's crowdsourcing traffic flows. So we need to sort of begin to get in to the view that we're beginning to get more and more tracked. But it allows us to make great maps. This is the London Twitter map. And the peak of London is Soho Mountain. This is where pe people most tweet from. But they also tweet from, from um, transport hubs. And it allows our work to get into the mass press, to mass outreach. And that hopefully allows us to make more contacts, which write letters of support for grants, and carries on the work. So it's, it's kind of a fine line. It's a fine line between marketing and communicating research. But Twitter is an ex extremely powerful social toolkit. And you can add height to it. This, and for, for, for you, this is a bit dark. But this is in software that you can play as a game. So you can fly around it. And uh, you know, this is the London Twitter island. And it has li little waves that lap. And it's beginning to put geographic visualization online in more of an engaging way. So we always sort of view it that if you put something in front of policymakers, they often have a, you have a 40 second pitch. They don't want to read a report. They don't want to click through a PowerPoint. You have that pitch there and then. If you can show them something that grabs them and then communicate the policy changes behind it, then maybe you can get your research seen and used more. And you can actually strip all of the geographic marking away. And this is the Twitter island as an actual island. Now, I put this in there because it goes against everything that your normal, ge your normal geographer does. Oh my God, you've got no names on it, you've got no markers. But I love the fact that here we're flying past Soho Mountain and onwards to Clerkenwell Ridge. And it's beginning to make landscapes of the crowdsourced feeds. And we put all of our work onto YouTube, so it's rated. So if your work is, is bad, people are quite vocal. They'll say, that's quite poor. And the soundtrack to this is, Diabolical, which I think was, uh, 
was heavily flagged up. But the view from Soho Mountain is a beauty. So just new ways to put information online. And we built a physical version. This is how Twitter meter would have looked like in the 1930s. And it was up on the wall for a whole year. So again, it allowed us to put our research into a public space. And you can put it into a public space, you begin to get geography known a little bit more. And you can do the same things with a whole range of these crowdsourced feeds, bikes. This is via data mining. So we don't crowdsource, we actually grab it. So we go onto various websites and we grab the feeds. Uh, I, we got four, five cease and desist letters through the post. Because it's a bit of a legal minefield, whether you can grab all of this data. And there are times when you're sort of running a research lab and you think, oh, this, this isn't going to go down well. Five legal notes to stop our research. So we took the work offline, but we left them sort of just floating there. So people asked why these rental schemes around the world didn't want their data feeds online. And it's because we can show how well they are working. So we're looking towards, this is towards the 30 minute future stuff, looking towards at how places are actually performing here and now. And it allows us to do time-lapse type work, so to com com communicate geographic data over time. This is the rental scheme, and in rush hour, everyone hops on, and they, they go to the outer ring, and they park, park their bikes, they go home, then a van comes around, picks them up, drives them back in, in, into town. But this is a very quick and easy way to communicate how well quite a complex system works. And it's something you can put in front of the mayor, policy makers, and show how London places are currently working. So we're moving towards seeing how networks work from a geographic point of view. Oh, this is completely blank. This is London at night. This is a actually a complete visualisation of all of the transport networks. So you've got planes, you've got trains, buses, co coaches, all here. The tube network wakes up. Unfortunately, the l it's not quite bright enough to see. But it it's, was put in to make the point that there's all of this transport data out there. So there's crowdsourcing, there's social network, there's transport data. There's the Oyster car data. Every time you tap in, we have that feed. We can talk to Transport for L London and they can give us the dump. We've got the Oyster car dump for the last six months. And you can see how London begins to wake up and its heart beats as you tap in and you tap out. You, you can just about see the heart here begins to beat as networks begin to wake up. So for 2012, we're looking towards getting a near real-time feed of Oyster card check-ins, check-outs, to see how, how the network's <coughs> working. And this is our latest work we've just put online. This is using all of the live feeds in one central place. And it works on the iPhone, the iPad, works as a web page. And let me just see if I can pause it just before it goes to the map. We wanted to put online geographic feeds, which were not necessarily the norm, because you know everyone does the normal stuff. So we've got radiation counts. We sourced a radiation counter and we've plugged it into work. And it has a live background radiation count there. We have the height, height of the attempts. We have the mappiness work. We have a live transport feed, weather feed, shares, and it updates itself. So it just, it's beginning to update data live in an easy to view way. But it's all geographic based. So there's a map view too. I'm not quite sure the map view works yet. It's, it seems to be much simpler to move away from the map. Now from a geographic point of view, this is not what we normally do, but 
you don't always have to have a map. You just need to know what the geographic feed is. So just looking at towards live feedback loops. We've got various websites online. Rich is probably going to talk about this more. A um, site called maptube.org, which was a place to, place to put proper maps. So not your, your so public made maps, but an easy place to view census maps. Because if you're not an academic who knows how to download the shape files for census or stuff, you just want to see them first off. We've put all of the census maps online. So you can just quickly log in see what they look like, and then download them, should you so wish. And we've done crowdsource surveys. Our first one was about five years ago. This was the Radio 4 Credit Crunch in Credit Crunch 1. And we asked people what their views, whether they were worried about paying the mortgage, the fuel, the rent. And we got a real-time map based back of giving the UK's view. Now, we had about 22,000 inputs to this. So this is merging the Web 2 world with the traditional media world, because Radio 4 put it out during the week. And that allowed us to get thousands of people in place. And then we moved it away from radio, because I always wanted to see maps used in a weather forecasting point of view. We did something with Look East. If you go to the Look East website and look for our section on antisocial behaviour, you'll get the chance to say what's going on in your part of the world. Of course, this is not scientific, just a snapshot. You have to fill in your postcode and choose one of the options, for example, noisy neighbours. You'll then be able to see a colour-coded map of the region. So far, more than 2,000 of you have taken part, and this is what the map is showing. Red is for drunken youths, yellow for noisy neighbours, light blue for boy racers, dark blue for no problems, and green for great community with no problems. It's based on postcodes, so just because there's a lot of one colour, it doesn't mean that whole area has a huge problem. Remember, rural postcodes are bigger than urban ones. So we had a whole debate at work about whether to advise them on what questions to ask. I said, no, no, no you, you don't want to jump in. You don't want to be the academic that says, look, we can advise you. We, I trusted the BBC to ask suitably useful questions. And it turns out they asked the most tricky question to answer because they basically asked the same thing four times about drunken youths, good community, but don't like my name, neighbours, great community. But the interesting thing is that it's a crowdsourced map using our toolkits, free of charge, and it's used in a weather forecast type way. Now, there's a whole ac academic debate here about whether it's just all noise. Perhaps it is, but at least we can gather data in real time now, so I don't have to log in to some, some mapping service and download stuff. I can actually get the people's view. So we've widened it out, something called surveymapper.com. <laughs> It's a slightly tricky soundtrack. <coughs> and we've hidden the science here. The UCL logo is not there, the research logo is not there, because we've made it crowdsourced. We don't want to frighten people off. It's quite hard to set questions air, questionnaires up in, in the first place, let alone then say you can map it in real time. So every time someone types, a, types an answer in, the map updates itself in real time, and you can download that afterwards. But we fronted it with a cross-eyed giraffe called Roger. And we're, we're trying new, new worlds. You know, you know, the academic world has been done time and time. And I'm intrigued that if we step out of that comfort zone, and it is out of a comfort zone, you do academic conferences and you squirm a bit, but maybe you get more, more users here. But the work, the, the servers, the code, is exactly the same. It's just a new way. And then I thought augmented reality was dead. But this is everything geographic. This is Google Glasses. So this is bringing the survey stuff 
because you're geographically located throughout the whole thing, with live feeds, and the web is everywhere here. Perhaps this is moving towards Web3, because you don't see the web, it's just there. Yeah. Um, meet me in front of Strand Books at 2. I view the last bit of this as a bit like the San Francisco version of the UK Match.com advert. It's a different world. Hmm. Oh man, really? Hey there, guy. Hey there, little guy. Sweet. Remind me to buy tickets for Monsieur Gano tonight. So everything geographic located. Where's the music Google section? Google are mapping indoors now, which allows you to do proper navigation mapping. Uh, oh, yes. Because they this know where the Wi-Fi points are. Is Paul here yet? Huh. Hey, dude. How's it going? Want to go check out that new place I was telling you about? Sure. This truck's really good. Hey, just a second. Cool. Good to see you again. Thanks, man. Just got a new place, not so soon. See you, dude. So that photo will now Whoa. be geographically cool. shared. Cool. Take a photo of this. Share it to my circles. Oh. I'm running late. Music, stop. Hi, what's up? Hey. Hey. You want to say something cool? Yeah, sure. Is that a ukulele? Yep. Okay, here goes. So from a UK point of view, you've got Match.com, <laughs> girl on the platform, knackered old train it's goes beautiful. past. And this is the San Francisco one. <laughs> It's, it's just shivers down the spine and stuff. But you can grab geographic data from all of this. Once people are walking around, they will be giving you live feeds. So you know where people are, you know what they're looking at, you know what they're tagging. And they're out next year, 1,500, aren't they? And then to move on to things, this is a, the final bit. We got a research grant in which took us out of our comfort zone into the Internet of Things. We made something which is a mix of face Facebook, the Antiques Roadshow, and eBay. The Antiques Roadshow, it's a bit of an age thing, but I love it. <laughs> I, I settle down, I try and guess what things cost and stuff. <laughs> but um, the, the, the things they come up with, the things should talk. Now, we're in a connected world, everything's connected nowadays. The vase from China should say it was made from China. It was shipped on this route. You should have a map linked with, with, with it. And we're trying to make things talk. It's something called Tales of Things. And we've made something called the World of Things from a geographic point of view. So we've got about 6,000 people just doing talking heads about the things that they own. And I'm interested in getting geography down to the actual items, the chairs that we're sat in now, this room, and we tag things, and we replay these talks. So if you own one of the things that they're talking about, you have that clip in your hand via your mobile phone. So we're trying to move away from, from the web in some ways, but grabbing geographic location and towards um, allowing things to talk. We took over an Oxfam shop for a week. This is a jumper. Okay, so um, I've donated this pink stripy jumper because um, I had it last year and I wore it to a barbecue and um, I met a boy at the barbecue and um, he was my boyfriend for a few months but we're not together anymore so I thought I'd donate it. So I just love the fact that that jumper talks. But from a geographic point of view, I love the fact that I know where that jumper is. And I know that it goes live on a map. Okay, as soon so as um, I've it. donated this now, pink stripy jumper. And it tweets too, that jumper um, tweets. I had it last year. So everything that we upload 
automatically yeah, sends a tweet out you if you click yes. Yeah. Um, now I don't know whether this is a good thing. A months, but, but nevertheless, these are some things that I've tagged, some of the tats from my own my own life. This is a 1970s Smith's watch. Point your phone at the tag. My watch has its own web page. Every item you upload to the site, my mug, it automatically gets its own web page. And if you've got that watch, it means I've either sold it or you've obtained it via mi other means. And it allows you a little talking head, this is me, talking about where this watch came from. So it gives value to things. But every time I scan it, the phone uploads the geographic location. So this is the world of things. Uh, this map will not be available for much longer because we're having to take it offline due to just worries. If you, we know where your items are in your house, then surely you could go and obtain them when you're out. So the World of Things map is really interesting from a geographical point of view because we've got down the technology to give everything its own web page, make everything tweet, and grab the geographic location of everything begins to change the research world beyond our world. But it's, it's uh, tricky. We were told by our academic advisory board to go and ponder what we have done. <laughs> so I take that as legal code for take it offline. <laughs> but we've made Oxfam's first iPhone app now. So we linked up with Oxfam. We're in 10 current shops. And it turns out people like things that have a story attached. They value things more. It's a narrative system. And we're looking at making Oxfam's a social museum where everything's geographically based. And we've just tagged 4,600 bus stops in Norway. Each of these bus stops tweets. So I don't necessarily follow people on Twitter. I follow bus stops, which probably means I need to get out more, <laughs> actually. But so people can leave messages behind. So last month, one of these bus stops tweeted that someone had lost a pair of mittens. And there was a YouTube clip of a, these lost pair of mit mit mittens just left behind. But that bus stop sent it out, and it knows where it is. So we're moving towards geographically aware networks. Now, I'm not saying this is a self-aware network of Norwegian bus stops here. But because the data is shared and it's geographically linked, we're beginning to change the way geography is gathered and geography is viewed. So from a Web3 point of view, I think the key thing is that the web is just everywhere. You don't have to think about it. Currently, you still have to think about it. I struggle to get the network working. It, it's still not quite there. But once I've got the glasses, or whether it's a watch, or whatever new system, I won't think about it. And that means I can actively data mine. And the research methods will change. They've already changed in the last two years. We almost don't do the traditional research routes, because we know that's there, we can do it if we wish, but we're more interested in these new toolkits which we're trying to make. And if we can look towards simulating all of this data within the next 30 minutes to an hour, we can see how places are operating now. And that's moving towards a real-time census. This is what excites me currently about the research world. Um, it upsets quite a lot of people too, because do we want to know where we all are? Well, no, but I'm not sure we have much choice. And that's geography in a Web 3.0 world. Thank you very much.